Hi, everyone. Let's get this up properly. Hi. Cameras on, please. How's everyone doing? It's been a long time. I've been very excited to start class again. It's like, feels like it's been about a month, I think. Somehow it feels a lot longer than that. So it's wonderful to see everyone. Hope you had a good vacation. <laughs> ACI kind of did. We um we decided to take the month of August off, which was a great time. Was was great for creativity. Like, and I really, I mean, one of the big things that we're going to talk about <laughs> in this class, besides the actual content, is what's the value of everything that we're doing. Like, what's the value of saying, oh, look, we're going to take a month off to go deeper into our lives. Like, we're going to take a month off to see our families, right? We're going to take a month off to reflect on things. And, and whether you go into an actual retreat or you're just kind of like, well, I'm going to, hang out at the beach for two weeks, which is kind of what I did. You know, just to take that time to go deeper into your practice as well. Like I actually practiced. <laughs> it was really wonderful. It was really wonderful to, to practice. And this class is going to talk a lot about why, like, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? And what's the main point, right? What's the main point of all of this? Let's see. And if, and if you, oh, there we go. We have about half the people with cameras on. It's lovely to see all your faces. Oh, look at all the people from Romania. That's wonderful. Hi, Octavian. So I'm just going to, so if you're brand new, I don't think many of you are, but if you are brand new to this, we've been in, we've been covering at a very high level, but also at sort of the, I guess, all the main points, like what are all the main points that Shantideva has in his guide to Bodhisattva's way of life that would make your practice successful? And the first eight chapters are incredibly deep and they provide a tremendous amount of looks like really good practice details. Like how do you practice when you get upset? Right? What are the things that you do? And then Shanti Deva shows up in chapter nine. And he basically says, everything I just told you was wrong. <laughs> everything I told you doesn't really work. So I'm sorry that you wasted the last two classes of your, of your existence. <laughs> which is actually not entirely true. But this is the time when Shantideva gets into the deepest layer of our practice, the deepest layer that once you have gone through understanding what your afflictions are, understanding what the patterns are in your life, having awareness of that. And then, you know, basically you know, putting some band-aids on those and very good band-aids, you know, very good. And they're very good seeds that you plant as well in that, no problem. He says, well, if you really want to end those sufferings, if you really want to change that, if you really want 
to because I don't know about you guys, but I kind of get frustrated because we have all of these practices, you know, and then I just wake up in the morning and I'm like, another day. <laughs> I don't know if you guys had that feeling, but it's like, oh, another day of this, you know, and then you're like, but I want to end this. Right. And, and a lot of the early practices that we get are about preparation. They're about preparing ourselves, preparing our minds, preparing our bodies, preparing our awareness, preparing, I would even say preparing our emotions to be able to then say, all right, enough of the crap. You know, enough of this. Like I had somebody came to me last week, I think, and I asked them how their month was. I've asked them how they were doing. And, and they said, well, I don't think I had any realizations this last month. I said, well, you know, that's okay. <laughs> and, and he said, but I think that I realized that I, I need to get out of this. And I said, what do you mean? And, and my friend said that his renunciation got a lot stronger basically said, if I learned anything, is that what I'm doing today, is that going to be enough to take care of future me or to take care of my future family? And, you know, he was worrying about his child who will eventually go to college. His child's like three years old now. He's like, I don't even know how I'm going to afford to pay for them. And I, and I, and at first I was kind of like, is that renunciation? Right. I was, I was thinking like, I'm, I'm listening to my friend, right. <laughs> I'm not, you know, I'm not verbally judging them, <laughs> but I was wondering, I was like, is that really renunciation? You know, and as I listened further and further, he said it, he was like, I don't even know if I'm going to be here in 15 years, 20 years when my child is ready for college. And he said, I have to do the work now. And I was like, okay, that's renunciation. <laughs> okay. right. You know, he was feeling like he didn't have time anymore. He didn't have time. You know, and how quickly the time does go by, you know? And so I don't know, I'm gonna go back and review the story of Shantideva, like what happened? Like, so we can sort of understand where we are in the book because we're moving into the emptiness chapter, the chapter nine. And this is when I would say that the Oftentimes people think that course 13, which is the next course we'll do in, in January, you know, Buddhist logic debate. A lot of people think like that's like the course that separates. We have a bad expression in English um, that separates the children from the adults. Okay. And that's where a lot of people just say, you know what, I can't do this anymore. But I'm going to say that now, <laughs> course 12, because I think that what will separate practitioners is whether you're actually serious about changing your life. Are you actually serious about making that change? Are you serious about your study? Are you serious about reaching those higher goals? You know, and we're going to be spending an entire, you know, 10 classes talking about emptiness. We're going to be talking about the deepest teachings that Shantideva has. And, 
if that is something that you don't want to do, don't come. <laughs> I'm going to be straightforward about it. Don't come. Because what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be creating an energy together to understand the most liberating and most difficult thing there is to understand. You know, it's more difficult than quantum physics. It's more difficult than getting the karma to be the leader of your country. Right? If you want to be the president or prime minister of your country, it's easier to get the karma to do that than it is to see emptiness directly. And I'm not saying just turn off the cameras and give up. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that. Because on the other side of it, you have a very, very special karma to even be here. You know, to be able to be in a Zoom call, how many are we now? We're 72. To even be here, that hear these teachings. You know, you're allowed to feel a little special. All right. <laughs> you're allowed to be, you're, you're allowed to have a little bit of pride about that. You're allowed to be like, yeah, I have, there's a specific karma that I have to be here and you should rejoice in it because you are close. You are close to understanding it. So, but commit to being here. If you're here and you want to come to class, commit to being the class. And I know some of you will be watching this on recording later. That's okay. But commit to watching the recordings in a, in a reasonable time. Commit to watching them on a regular basis. Don't miss class. Because then you're going to miss an important piece. You're going to miss an important piece that will that would potentially have to be the difference between making an actual change or putting a band-aid on things. Okay. Do you want band-aids or do you want results? Okay. The band-aid, when you cut your when you cut your arm, right? And you put the band-aid on it. The Band-Aid does absolutely nothing to heal. It might prevent more dirt from going in, right? It might make you feel a little bit better, right? That's what you do with to children. Oh, let me put a little Band-Aid on that, right? They're crying. They fell down. They clearly have no cuts or scrapes. They're not even bleeding. And they say they have an owie. Ow, it hurts, right? <laughs> you go, okay, and you put a band-aid on it. And then you're done, right? And then the kid feels a lot better. Two minutes later, they stop crying. And then they go outside and play, right? But the band-aid doesn't stop the pain, right? <laughs> it doesn't stop the owie, you know, but can we stop that? And, and, I, and I ask you to make that commitment. If you're going to be here, be here. Come to class, you know, do the work. And then on top of it, all of these courses were designed to get you to a certain place, you know, and, and we're getting closer to that place. You know, we're getting closer to, you know, yeah, we're course 12. We still have six more left, seven more classes, six. But this is this is a big transition course. So don't be lazy. <laughs> don't be lazy. Just come, you know. A few other commitments, understand, well, what's the importance of that commitment versus the commitment that could change you entirely? Right? And yes, things will get in the way. Things will happen. I understand. But those things are actually obstacles to emptiness. Obstacles to seeing emptiness. I want you to start paying attention to the number of interruptions you get 
when you're studying emptiness. Pay attention. Where does your mind go to? Where does their distractions go to? Right? First thing that happened to me, right? About to teach the class, right? And I'm, I was looking at the camera here, right? And over there, there was something on the floor. My suitcase, because I came, I, you know, I came home from a trip like a couple of days ago, and I haven't emptied out the suitcase. I just opened it up and took a few things out, and the suitcase was in the shot, was in the camera shot. So I was like, oh, I should get that out of the way so it looks nice, so you know, I can look professional, right? <laughs> you don't see how messy my house is. So I walked over, picked up the suitcase, put it in the room over there, and as I put it down, I moved in this little way that there was a shooting pain in my back. Right. I, I kind of, I didn't set it down properly, you know, didn't, you know, use my legs, you know, I've leaned forward in the wrong way. All this, all the things that tell you not to do. And I did it anyway, right. Because I was moving quickly and I was like, Oh, I gotta get to class on time. And then my back was like, and I was like, you know, and my first thought was, Oh, God damn it. You know, things were feeling really good for a while. And then this happened. Um, but then I was like, oh, this is an obstacle to teaching emptiness. I'm about to teach a really powerful class on emptiness. And so weird things will happen that will try to get in the way of your practice. Will try to get in the way of your understanding how things actually work. How things actually become your reality. Like, so then all of a sudden my mind has to focus on the pain, right? And I'm like, damn it, right? <laughs> and I've been sitting here and you probably notice I'm kind of like rubbing my back and I'm trying to move in a way and try to free up the whatever happened, right? And it'll be fine, don't worry. because I can feel it right in my hip. So, but notice, notice the Stupid things that get in your way when you're trying to understand emptiness. Like your computer won't work. Someone will call you. Your back will just start hurting. You know, why didn't I take care of the suitcase last night? <laughs> right? <laughs> why didn't I, you know, why, why couldn't I have just pushed it with my feet? You know, why did I choose to pick it up versus push it? You know, who knows? A million different reasons. When we were in Mexico and Geshla gave a beautiful, beautiful class on emptiness, someone in the middle of the class, as he was going deeper into it, came up to me and started whispering in my ear. And I was like, <laughs> I didn't hit them in the face, but I was like, later. And they got mad at me. And I said, sit down and watch the class. Don't worry. This is the most important thing right now not whatever thing you needed to tell me about something we had to do after class. Don't care right now, right? But I was like, I didn't let it happen. You know, and I wasn't really rude about it. I was just like, hey, you know, I want to watch the class. But don't let the distractions come. And they will, all right? I promise. They will come. So just take note of them. Get a piece of paper. I, I like to have in my book, which I don't know where it is. It's over there somewhere. In my book practice, I like to write down like when it happens, what distracted me from my goal? What distracted from my goal right now? Right? And then just start taking notes. And then you can notice, wow. There's all these things that I'm doing that have nothing to do with the highest goals. And I'm not saying don't do the important things. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm, what I, what I'm getting you to question is what are the things that happen in your life that distract your mind and pull you into band-aids? Right? Here's a band-aid. My hip hurts right now. Ooh, I'm going to rub it right here. Like, oh, like right at the, I got it right in the, atta the attachment of the piriformis, right? 
I got it, right? <laughs> I can feel it. So I'm going to rub that spot, right? Here's my Band-Aid, right? Does giving yourself a massage take away the pain? That's a good question. Does, taking a, does, does massaging a painful muscle take away the pain? It could, right? But if I understand the why of the pain, maybe it's not, maybe the why is so much deeper than just the little knot that's forming right there, right? But yeah, so deal with your pain, but how are you dealing with your pain? That's the most important question. How do you deal with it? You see. So Shanti Deva, you probably have heard about. We, we told this story way back in class nine, but I'm going to tell it again because it's a lot of fun. I'm having a look here. By the way, you know, if you're attending class and your camera's not on, I would ask why in the context of this. What else are you doing? that you can't turn on your camera. Ah, Cornelia is like, I'm walking with my kid, Tim. Don't, <laughs> don't blame me. <laughs> That's okay. Right, but I would wonder, like, what else, what else are you doing? Like, what else are you doing right now? Have you made the commitments to come to class? <laughs> okay good job I, I appreciate that if it's too hot you don't have enough clothes on that you don't have your camera on thank you <laughs> it's not that kind of class thank you <laughs> but really like what are you doing like why are you here you know are you here just for a little bit or are you here for are you here for the whole thing so Shanti Deva, the story is pretty simple. And we've we've known I've known people like this, right? Like the quiet people who kind of just don't seem like they're doing anything. Right? They're kind of just sitting there. They don't seem really engaged. You don't really think they're like up to much. You probably think they're a little dumb, right? They're there, but you're like, you know, you, every language probably has its own expressions to describe somebody like that. And I, I, have, I have one that came to mind, but I don't want to repeat it. You know, you just kind of look at them and you're like, you're just kind of useless, right? You don't really see, you don't see any, like they're not adding any value to things. They're just kind of hanging out. Not really, you know, I, I see people like that at the cafe sometimes. And and this is kind of how people perceive Master Shantideva. They didn't even call him a master. They were just like, yeah, Shantideva. They didn't even call him Shantideva. I can't remember what his original monk's name was. Does anyone remember what his name is? And it's not Mr. Three Things yet, but he has a, his monk's name is, um, I don't know, I'll remember it. No, no, Busuku is not his monk's name. That means Mr. Three Thoughts, eat, sleep, and shit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's not, that's his nickname, but his, his ordained name. <laughs> <laughs> venerable eat sleep and shit <laughs> nope before that he had another name before that Gail says she was and it's way before that uh, anyway and the point is everyone just saw him as this kind of useless guy who lived in the monastery he only seemed like he did three things he would get up he would have his breakfast, he would poop, and then he would go back to sleep. 
and repeat the cycle. And so everyone was kind of like, this guy's kind of useless. Okay, I'll tell you the expression in English, a useless piece of shit. That's what we would say. <laughs> it's, you know, like your dog goes outside, poops on the, in the yard, right? It's more useless than that, right? <laughs> so the other monks were like, look, we need to embarrass him and we need to kick him out, but we can't really kick him out. So we'll just embarrass him because he's not really doing anything wrong. He's just not doing anything at all. So they decided they were going to ask him to teach a class. And he was like, well, I don't know if I can do that. And like, oh, you can do that. Just come, you know, go when the next, like the next satsang, come to come, you'll have, a, we'll have the throne ready for you. And then you can teach. So he shows up. And he shows up in the teaching room and the three or four, you know, say, you know, the kind of misfits are kind of laughing because they set up the teaching throne, which was much higher than he could possibly climb onto it. And it didn't have a ladder and there was no way to actually get up there. You know, and they're kind of laughing in the back being like, oh, he, he can't even teach because he can't get on the teaching throne. Um, and I don't know the exact order of things, but I'll just make it up as I, I, as I go. So as he's walking up to the throne, he kind of walks behind it and they're all laughing like, oh, he's not going to be able to get up there. And all of a sudden they blink and he's sitting at the top of the throne. And they're all, and everyone's kind of like, whoa, that's kind of weird. How did he do that? And so Shanti Davis sitting up there and, you know, he probably had a really meek voice like a very soft nervous voice like you can kind of imagine what you might be like like if you were for the first time teaching in front of all the monks for example right or if you were a great master you probably would know that everyone was messing with you anyway right so you would just play along and i've seen masters do that they just kind of play along with everything they pretend very well that they that they are dumb or they don't know what's going on. My teacher is really good at pretending that he's dumb. And I'm like, I'm not fooled by you. <laughs> you know, like I've seen you when you're not dumb and you're not dumb. You know, and but it, but they play along, right? Because there's some there's some higher purpose. So he gets up there and like in his meek monk voice says, do you guys want to hear something you've already heard or do you want to hear something new? And the guys in the back are like, oh, this is going to be great. They're like, oh, Shantideva, in your infinite wisdom, teach us something new. So he says, okay. So then he starts reciting the guide to the Bodhisattva's way of life, which he has written. You know, and within five minutes, everyone's like, oh shit, this guy is not who we thought he was. Right. And I think it's a really big lesson for us to think about the way that we judge people. Who are they really? Right. Some of the most interesting people might just be socially awkward. <laughs> or maybe they've worked on their pride so much that they have no reason to show off. Maybe they have zero reason to show everyone what they know. And so they just kind of appear to be a lump, <laughs> a lump in the corner, right? But maybe they're the smartest people and you just don't know. And, you know, and I would say like, 
you know, Geshe Michael tells the story of when he was at what was Peachtree Cafe, formerly known as Crickets, on Saturday mornings or Tuesday afternoons, this old guy would, would come up to the table and he would be like, you know, kind of shaking a little bit, kind of quiet and like pouring, like filling your cup of coffee, right? Your bottomless cup of bad coffee, right? At a diner, you know, so he's, you know, he's pouring it, right? Kind of quiet, kind of shy. Geshe thought he was kind of dumb, right? <laughs> Turns out he's the guy that discovered Pluto. <laughs> at the observatory at the top of the mountain, right? He's just a humble guy serving coffee at his wife's cafe who just happened to be the guy who discovered Pluto, right? Pretty smart guy. When he invited us over to his house one night and he has uh, telescopes in his backyard, like he has the, what are they called? The things you put telescopes into observatory. He has little observatories in his backyard that open up, like they just open up a little bit to prevent the light, any light from coming in, or just a little bit of light. And then he has all these old telescopes. And when he came over to his, invited us over to his house one night. And we just, and the guy knows so much about the stars and about the planets. You know, and we were going around looking at all these things and like, here's the guy that was serving me coffee in the morning right? Who looked kind of dumb, right? <laughs> but put him in an observatory and he's the smartest person you ever met, right? So here's Shanti Deva being like, hey guys, well, you know, I might know something and he starts teaching. Now, when he gets to the ninth chapter, which is what we're going to talk about now, something magical happens. He starts floating off of the throne, and he starts floating higher and higher and higher into the, um, I guess, like into the the high ceiling of the cathedral or I don't know, the, the auditorium that they were in. And so it becomes harder and harder to hear, which is also another thing about emptiness. It becomes harder and harder for everyone to hear what he's actually saying about emptiness. And then eventually, you know, he floats maybe through a window or if the magic more magically just throats, floats through the ceiling. And only those who have excellent hearing can hear him because they've had, they have an excellent understanding of emptiness, right? And eventually he floats off and floats away and only a few people can actually hear the entire chapter because they're kelwa, they're good virtue. allows them to hear it. And this is what I was saying is that if you don't have the virtue to hear about the thing that could change everything, you won't hear it. You will get distracted. You will be doing something else. You will get a phone call. You will get interrupted in the middle of a class. I promise, I promise it'll happen, right? Your bad seeds will start ripening and then all of a sudden it'll be like, oh, I have to attend to this thing. And then you'll forget that you were even here in class. Don't let it happen. Don't let Shanti Deva float up out of your Zoom screen. Okay. Keep Shanti. I'm not Shanti Deva. I'm just reporting on Shanti Deva. Okay. <laughs> but seriously. Seriously, be be here. Be attentive. Don't let the don't let the teachings float away. Don't be the one person who had an opportunity to see emptiness directly. And you let some stupid distraction get in your way 
some stupid samsaric distraction that will get which will end anyway. You have to make choices. Like that's the thing about, you know, bodhisattvas. And if you're still here after 12 into 12 classes, we got 85 people. Excellent. Right. We started with, I don't know, what, 150 when we first started the classes. Right. 85 of you are still here. Yes. Excellent. You know, but to keep reinvesting that virtue. Like keep giving it, like offer it to other people. Sandra is giving a beautiful, is helping to organize a beautiful tour in Colombia, right? She's bringing the teachings. She's giving it. She's continually reinvesting those seats, right? Some of you are dealing with war right now. I got a message last night about how someone had to leave their home because the next street over was being bombed in their nightgown and the jacket, right? But they're still here right now, <laughs> you see. You know, they're doing their best. You know, but whatever the distraction is, you know, understand where it's coming from. And, and I'm sorry for those of you that are experiencing those things, but, you know, let's work on changing them. And that this is the kind of thing that can. All right, here we go. Let's get our... I got my PowerPoint here. Hope you guys like it. All right. So what we need to first understand is what is, what are we fighting against? Like, and I think this is really a good, like a good place to, because we have different ideas of what emptiness is and what emptiness is not. And if we understand what it's not, and we understand what are those things that are blocking us, okay, what are those things that are distracting or pulling us away? So much so that it pulls a veil over our face, right? You know, I, so much so that, you know, whether something good is happening, like you met a new person that you're completely in love with, right? Or you have bombs going off down the street, right? If you don't ask the question, why me? Like why, why those seats, right? Oh, why have I fallen in love? Why do I just see massive destruction? Both of those things will wear out eventually without understanding. The person that you loved last week becomes your enemy in two weeks. The bombs that were falling last week stop in two weeks. They can, they will change. It all will change. But we have this veil that comes over us where we don't really think about it that much because it's effing intense. It is effing intense to be in love. Right? Those first like, moments and this you know your heart's beating and you're like you can't get enough of them and you can't even sleep and then when you're together like you know it's intense you don't usually ask well why because you're afraid you're gonna lose it so then you just go more and more and more you know the same thing with you know 
war like why like most of the time you're just trying to get away from it you're trying to protect yourself you're trying to think well i hope it doesn't happen to me i hope it doesn't happen to my friends ow I'm sorry my foot i just got bit by an ant on my foot that's why i said ow i have ants in my house i can't get rid of them <laughs> that's my biggest karmic project <laughs> I'm I'm really worried about them because I'm I'm moving in a couple weeks and I'm renting this apartment out and I don't want to rent it to a non-Buddhist because then if I rent it to a non-Buddhist they're going to demand that I use bug spray to kill the to, to kill the bugs right so I'm trying to figure out how to get rid of them so they just bit my foot that's what happened i'm like thanks guys <laughs> um if you have any suggestions how do i how i could get rid of them i tried everything there's no food in the house that's open so i don't know some other seed we'll think about it <laughs> with me great Pack them up. That's great. Right, Sharon? I know where the hole is, but the problem is they're never not out of the hole. So if I plug the hole, then the ones on the inside will die. I don't know. Got to think about it. We'll think about it. Speak gently, Steve. Hmm. Maybe there's something going on. Okay. So we need to understand. So this is the question. Like we need to understand why me? Why do I have ants? I mean, I want to learn Dharma. That's so sweet. Like, why me? Right? Why do I fall in love? Stupidly over and over again, and it doesn't work. Why do I have to live in a war-torn place? Why do I have to get in an argument with a guy at the cafe who told me I'm the reason why America is not great again? <laughs> it was so funny. He told me that I'm the reason America is not great. I was like, wow, that, <laughs> that was a huge insult. By the way, if anyone, if any, if we're having an, we're in an election cycle in the United States, and one of the candidates' slogans is "Make America Great Again." All right, so that's what he's referring to. I thanked him for making it a political discussion and reducing everything to black and white, which didn't help the argument at all. Um, Eventually, I just had to do the Dharma thing, and I was like, okay, you're right. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yes, you're right. <laughs> it was really funny. Afterwards, it was funny. At the time, it wasn't. Actually, the best part of that argument discussion was after it was over, the guy behind me in line leaned over into my ear, and he said, stop being a dick. Stop being a jerk. And then the way he said it, he was basically telling me very kindly that I wasn't the mean one. It was the other person. I don't know. It's karmically weird, but it was really funny. Um, anyway, but the question is, why me? Like, why do I have to be forced to be in a line at a cafe, slightly irritated how long the line is, and then get into a somewhat heated discussion with the person in front of me, who I know. We're both regulars. We're allowed to discuss things. <laughs> He's annoying. He annoys me. He's always annoyed me anyway. But the point is, why do I get annoyed? Right? So what is this thing that's over top of us? What is, what is stopping us from seeing emptiness? What is stopping us from, instead of, in that moment, just being like, why me? Why do I have to see this? 
I have to engage a discussion. Why do I have to get insulted? You know, why all these things, right? And we call this, where did you go? Hold on. There we go. I have a new system here, if you guys haven't noticed. All right. We have, we call it the view of, destru of destruction. All right. And, and this is a great photograph, like a guy looking over a city that's completely destroyed. Okay. And I use this picture for many, many reasons. And for those of you who have Vajragini or going to get Vajragini, you'll understand later why. But this is the place where you that that Vajragini thrives in. Okay, this is the kind of place. But the view of destruction. All right. But what is that view? Like this is Chikta, like if you care for the Tibetan. Basically, the thing that destroys everything, okay, that destroys everything in your life is this view of destruction, this jikta. And what is this? All right. And what it really means is that this veil, this Is that expression going to work? These glasses that you put on your face. Here, I'm going to show you. It's kind of like this. I have I have all these different glasses because I'm I'm going through eye therapy that hopefully will fix my eyes and it is helping. It's getting slightly better. All right. But they give me all these glasses, right? I have to wear them, right? So first of all, I got to wear these like colored glasses, right? Red and greens. Right. So they kind of help with like see things a little bit differently and you know, see things in three dimensions on a on a on a force level, right? It's kind of like these, like you get you put on these kind of glasses, right? They put they give me these blue ones. I like these blue ones. Of course, you can't see my eyes on these ones. But it's kind of like putting on you you're wearing these glasses that you don't even know that you're wearing, right? You don't even know you're wearing them. And they basically are creating this view of destruction. And what I mean by that is that you're holding on to something. You're holding on to something that you think exists by itself on its own. I can't even read your things anymore. Okay. Um, you believe that you, me, you hold on to a view of me and mine. This me, this Tim, is here by himself for no reason at all. Okay. You, Sandra, are there by yourself. Barbara, you're there by yourself. Have nothing to do with seats. Nothing to do with how you treated others in the past. And this is how we view the world. We come out of the you come out as a baby. In fact, you already have this, you already have this thing going on when you're in the womb, right? You as a little tiny baby inside the uterus, surrounded by amniotic fluid, which is warm and cozy, you're swimming, right? You believe that you are you in there, and then everything, and then you belong there, right? You're just there. You believe that you're there. And you are there. Of course you're there. But you hold on to that so much that you can't see why you're there. And so this view of me and mine, me and my parts, which the parts also include all the stuff out here, You're holding on to that like it has a nature of its own. Like your feelings, right? How you feel about your new boyfriend or how you feel about the war or how you feel about the pain in your body. You know, how you feel about the taste of this coffee that doesn't have any sugar in it because I ran out. Right? How do I feel about it? 
how do I feel now that it's not hot anymore? It's kind of cold, unsweetened, brown liquid. How do I feel about it? Right? Whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, I'm still feeling like it's something, oh, that taste is in the coffee. Oops, right? That cold is in the coffee, right? And that's how we operate in the world. All that stuff is just there. The beautiful sun is in the sunlight. Oh, my eyeballs, right? Here we go. My eyeballs, right? <laughs> you know, they, they're not working properly. So I got to do all these weird, stupid things, right? That are helping, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, so I do the exercises not even asking the question, why me, right? Why me? Like, why do I have to, you know, I'm just like, you know, doing the tracking and practicing and all that stuff. And then even when I do my own meditation or I do my mantra practice, am I thinking why? Like, does the mantra have any power in it? Does me sitting on the meditation cushion have any power in it? right? And just get lost and just completely get lost in this view of destruction. And it's called view of destruction because that view destroys everything. Well, that's exciting. <laughs> and that's why you die. That's why you have to get old. And that's why you have to die. If you make it, if you don't have any other weird thing happen. So we have to understand what emptiness is not or what emptiness is combating or rather what we're doing to mask our understanding because it's really difficult to be sitting in your house asking the question why am, am are my neighbors being bombed and somehow relating that to your past karma I'm sorry, it is, and I'm sorry that I have, and I'm in a world where I have to still see that. But that's a really hard thing to navigate without going cuckoo, without going bananas, without losing your mind, right? Because yes, it has to do with your karma, but it may not have anything to do with who you are today. In fact, most of the things that happen to us now have nothing to do with the person that we are. And that's why you're very close. That's why you're very close to breaking through that veil. And the reason I'm using this word veil, you know, like, you know, like in... You know, in some cultures, like, you know, at a marriage, the woman wears a veil, right? And she enters in, you can't see her face and she walks down the aisle, right? And then she stands there and then her husband, her future husband in five minutes is standing there, right? And then you like take the veil off and you, and then you reveal, she reveals her beauty to him. Okay. Like, that's what it's like. It's like you, as her, are revealing your beauty to the world. Because if you can change that, then you become a light for other people. Let me see. Then you become someone that people go, I want some of that. I want that beauty. I want that. What are they doing? Right? And this is why I love what we're doing because we don't have to call it anything. We don't have to call it Buddhism. We don't have to call it ACI. We don't have to call it any organized blah, blah. We don't have to call it any of that. We just say, oh, let me help you see something. Right? And you hold up a pen. And they're like, oh, why are you holding up this pen? 
well, I'll, I'll tell you about that, you see. And then you can start opening the veil for people, right? And so if you can really understand emptiness and you can get a direct perception of it, then you can truly eliminate your negative emotions, right? So where you can change that, you can change that view of destruction into Nangde, right? Into Nirvana, right? Where then you are looking at the same parts and pieces yet you see something entirely effing different. I'll say it again. This person is standing in the same spot, but with different seeds. This person sees destruction. This person sees an incredible paradise. Which one is it? Is it the paradise or is it the destruction? Which one? Okay. And then that is a really hard thing to go tell someone whose neighbors are being bombed. <laughs> you see? Because somebody else could be having a completely different experience. Now, once you reach the highest goals, you also have the capacity to see how other people see it. And then that becomes an incredibly powerful tool to help them. Because as you progress along the path, your mind changes so much that you start to understand how other beings perceive their world. This being could be perceiving this, right? But the person standing next to them is seeing this. They can see what the other person is seeing and they're still seeing a paradise. And that's how they can help them. This person doesn't suffer anymore, but they sure as hell can see how everyone else is. And that's how you help people. Clean up your world. Clean up your impurities. Clean up how you, to be able to, clean up your view. Clean up your view of me and mine. And then cool shit just starts happening. You don't have to try to help people. You just do. You'll be sitting at dinner and, you're, and you'll see eight different realities happening. And you'll see them validly. At first, you practice, of course. You don't get to see it all. You don't get to see it perfectly. But you practice. You know, so the person who's helping you out of your suffering probably isn't going to tell you about the world that they see <laughs> directly. They're probably going to be like, oh, my God, this bombing sucks. Oh, my God, let's go help those people over there, right? Let's help them get the clothes they need. Let's help that family whose child just died. Let's go help them. And then they go help them. They go help you help them. That's what they do, right? They don't deny the worlds that are, they do not deny the worlds that are there for people. If the guy in the line believes that I'm someone who's not making America great, that's a completely valid world for him. Now, does that insult hurt? Yes, a lot. <laughs> But I'm not, you know, then I need to look at, you know, what does he think is great? And in fact, what he was saying was actually a really correct, like it was actually a virtue what he was talking about. He just was being a jerk about it. Like, 
you know, <laughs> I wonder why I just see that. So anyway, that's what we're working to do. This is what we're working to shift. So, um, so we needed, we're going to do a little bit of a review of what we've been doing. And what we've been doing is going through the six perfections. And we've been one by one reviewing, okay, what is the perfection of sharing? What is the perfection of ethics? What is the perfection of, of patience? Not getting angry when everyone is angry around you and telling you you're not making America great. Okay. Um, you know, what is it about joyful effort? What is it about meditation? And now we're in the sixth perfection, what, wisdom. So the question naturally comes up, are these six perfections kind of like a path where you do one and then you do two and then you do three and then four, et cetera, right? You do generosity first, then you do number two, then you do number three, and then those all become the basis to do number six, right? Is it is it a straight line? Like start with one, go through six, right? First grade to PhD, okay? elementary school to graduate school or is there some other way that these six are related to each other and does wisdom depend on those other five that's the question and i think they're very natural questions and these are questions that should come up when you're studying you're doing your sum, right? To sum gom, hours of class time, hours of thinking, hours of meditation, right? These are natural questions that come up in a discussion of how do we understand wisdom? So do we need all of those other five to have wisdom? Or can wisdom happen on its own without the other five? And the answer is, both, okay, <laughs> depending on your point of view. All right, so what are those different things, okay? So the question is, do you need those other five to have an understanding of emptiness? Yes or no? I already told you. Okay, I, Vo, okay, Rosalia, I guess that if I were to teach you the pen and the chew toy, that you wouldn't understand it intellectually without the other five perfections. Thank you for falling into the trap. I appreciate it. <laughs> that is... For those of you who want to become teachers, you have to learn to do that. Lead the students this way to then push them in the other direction, okay? If you ever get frustrated with your teacher, try to wonder why they led you in that direction in the first place. <laughs> Just going to smile. <laughs> because... Most of the time, the teacher sits in the background giggling and just waiting, right? But if I teach you the pen and the chew toy, okay, and you have an intellectual understanding of the pen, where the pen could either be a pen or it could be a chew toy, depending on who's looking at it, then you've had an intellectual understanding of emptiness, so Shantideva says, well, no, you don't need the other five perfections to understand this, All right? This is why we start there. We start there 
so that people will immediately understand what's going on. You can understand. Now, did you understand emptiness directly or intellectually in that moment? If anyone sees emptiness directly based on that one teaching, you got amazing seeds. Congratulations. <laughs> right? But you have an intellectual understanding that then becomes a basis for everything. Right? By the way, we're in question two. There's three parts to question two if anyone's looking at the homeworks. Um, someone told me it was difficult to do the homeworks after my classes because I didn't tell them when they were, when we were doing homeworks and I got indignant and I said, I don't care. <laughs> I said, the point is, is to learn the material. And the point is to think about it and figure it out together. Like I purposely don't tell you what homework we're doing because I want you to learn and then extrapolate and think. Um, but I think some learning styles do better when you tell them you're on a homework question. So I will be less indignant and be somewhat kinder <laughs> and sometimes tell you when we're on a homework question. So... Or in question two, there's three parts to question two. There's three answers to this question. Do you need the five other five perfections to have the sixth? The first answer is no, because pen and chew toy. You can understand it without having an understanding of anything else. But it helps you then if you understand pen and chew toy, then you can understand when Shantideva is going through all of his other band-aids in chapters one through eight, how maybe they're not band-aids and you didn't waste your time. Okay. So that's the first thing. The second thing is it's kind of the same thing, but it has to do with belief and conviction. is that you can gain a deep belief and conviction of an emptiness. This is my picture for it. Deeply convict, like belief, completely, like I'm totally into emptiness. Okay. Yes. Right. Without having a deep conviction in any other steps in the Lamrim. By the way, I love this meme. Because it's, you know, it's a meme and everybody knows it, but it's also from my hometown. This kid is in the hockey arena in Pittsburgh, right? Cheering on the Pittsburgh Penguins. Okay. That's why I also love it, right? This kid is like, yes, go, right? And this is how I get about hockey. I'm sorry. I, I do enjoy certain things um, like that. And I will go to a hockey game. So if anyone ever wants to take me to a hockey game, I will go. But it's a deep faith. You can have a deep spiritual experience about emptiness without seeing emptiness directly and without the other five perfect perfections. Okay. You can have deep insights into the nature of things, which isn't full direct experience of emptiness. But you can have those insights without the other five perfections, which will... keep you on the path of understanding you'll be like i cannot it is kind of like a, a realization where you can't go back like you knew it's this it's this and there's no other way and nobody else can convince me otherwise you see so you can have that deep experience where you're like no one can convince me otherwise without seeing emptiness directly and without the other five perfections. And then lastly, those five, you, the other reason is, is that 
you can also see emptiness directly on the lower tracks without the other five perfections, right? There's three tracks, listeners, self-made Buddhas, and then Bodhisattva track, right? In each of those, you can see emptiness on any of those three. You can have a, you can see emptiness directly without Bodhicitta, no problem. Of course, you got to go back and develop bodhicitta and all that other stuff, but it is entirely possible for someone to see the nature of reality and not have bodhicitta, according to the scriptures. Like a scientist could see emptiness directly, a physicist, because they finally understood where things were coming from. And science is getting really close to that, by the way. I think it'd be a fun debate if you all started thinking about um, if you saw emptiness directly, how could you not have bodhicitta? That'd be an interesting question. You know, if you knew everything was coming from you, how could you not take care of others? Well, you can debate it, all right? You can debate it. But there is a very specific experience that happens on the Bodhisattva track that doesn't happen on the other tracks. And we've talked about it. It's a direct perception of Bodhicitta, where you see the faces of all the, of every single living being. That does not happen if you see emptiness without Bodhicitta. So, Am I going to skip to that part? So let's skip to the good part. Oh, that, that's interesting. We're there already. Okay. So what is this? Like, wh Why are we putting so much emphasis on the third track? Okay. The Bodhisattva track. Like, what is the difference of, like, the of those of the lower tracks in the higher track. And, and this is a long room question. Like if you saw emptiness as a listener, if you saw emptiness as a, a self-made Buddha, right? Right, it's, a, it's how would it be slightly different? And it has to do mainly I'm going to keep myself out of the dregs of the debate ground so I don't get dragged through the mud. Mainly, the difference between the two is that seeing emptiness directly has the power to remove what type of impurities in you and what type of obstacles. Mm, 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 mm. Nope, nope, nope. I mean, yes, doubt is a one of them, but it's not the answer I'm looking for. Yes, Julia, that's correct. So seeing emptiness directly on its own by itself, okay, without bodhicitta, whether you're on the bodhisattva track or the non-bodhisattva tracks, has the power to remove all of your negative emotions. Your, they call them mental affliction obstacles. Whatever that means. <laughs> Sorry. Like, go talk to the guy in the cafe who's telling me I'm the one who's not making America great and be like, oh, you're having a mental affliction right now. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> what? Did you just put, what is this? Oh, that's such a cute picture. <laughs> that was me. At the picture Barbara just put in the chat was me on the first night in Mexico. <laughs> we had a, we had some kids running around, and for some reason, we didn't have a a nursery or or someone watching. I don't know something like that. So I was like. This kid was losing his mind, so I sat down with him. 
Um, we lose. Yeah. So executive director Tim was sitting in the back of a room full of 500 people taking care of a three-year-old. <laughs> okay. It was a lot of fun actually. And then all the other kids came by and they, um, and they listened to the class. It was kind of cool. I felt like I was surrounded by little bodhisattvas. Um, so, right. Seeing emptiness directly will remove all of your negative emotions. It will allow you to reach nirvana, period. Whether you're on the lower track or whether you're on the higher tracks. Okay. The higher track, singular. All right. That's cool. However, the lower tracks do not address another type of obstacle. All right, they don't address. The obstacles to knowing all things. Seeing emptiness directly does not remove the obstacles to omniscience. I got a picture for this. I like this picture, right? Being able to know all things, past, present, and future. All right. So in a certain way, is that those other five perfections enrich us with a limited mass of merit, limitless mass of good deeds, which allow us to achieve the second part, which is omniscience. Now you got to think about it. Now you got to think about What the hell does being a bodhisattva have to do with removing your obstacles to omniscience? That now you got to think about it. Why is not seeing why is seeing emptiness directly not enough? What does Those other five perfections, what is the bodhicitta? What is the actions of a bodhisattva have to do with creating a mind that knows all things? Right, you see emptiness directly, then you become an arhat on every track. But then to continue to move on, you need to have the bodhicitta. You have to have that incredible amount of additional karma, limitless karma, which, by the way, you will learn how to make karma limitless. What does that have to do with omniscience? So I, I'm going to invite you to, to meditate on that. That's your meditation assignment. What the heck does bodhicitta have to do with removing the obstacles to omniscience and why seeing emptiness directly is not enough? That's for you to figure out. All right. Okay. In the last 10 minutes, we're going to talk a, like the last piece we're going to do about understanding what emptiness is and what emptiness is not. Is when we're describing reality. Okay, so we're describing all existing things, right? We're talking about everything that there is. We can divide it into two things. Okay, and this division is incredibly helpful. And you're going to get some Tibetan for this. The first one is Kunso Dempa. Everybody say, everyone turn on your microphones and repeat after me. 
It'll sound like a bunch of coyotes. Couldn't so. Good job. Good job, everybody. <laughs> Good. This is the thing we're trying to understand. Kunso Demba. This is the word Demba means truth. Okay. It means uh, could uh, can you move your microphones, please? Now, <laughs> thank you. Unless you're an interpreter, um, demba means truth, right? Deceptive, fake reality. The reality that appears to you in a way that you think it's out there by itself on its own, right? We're using the word demba to mean truth. It means truth, like, but we're really describing reality, okay? And you have to think about why we use the word truth in Tibetan to use the word reality. So that's another thing you got to think about. All right. So kunzan demba, fake reality. All right. Here we go. This is I I this is a you know this, I think this is a good example like deep fakes, right? Where we now have the ability with AI to basically create any character, any person in the world saying anything. And it looks and sounds just like them, right? And I chose Tom Cruise. I don't know, this is the one that popped up, right? So this guy on the left is, 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 is saying a bunch of BS, right? And he creates a deep fake and it sounds like Tom Cruise is saying the same thing. All right. And this is frank, frankly, really, really dangerous in our world now. Right. If I post a video that's a deep fake of somebody I don't like saying something that they never said in the first place. Then everyone believes it because it looks and sounds real. This is what is happening in politics all around the world. It looks and seems real. And we when it's and we haven't developed in some places of the world, and I would say in the United States is probably true, we haven't developed a desire to really distinguish the difference between truth and a lie. My favorite word in English now is disinformation. <laughs> it's all over the news. Oh, that's disinformation. I'm like, it's not disinformation. It's an effing lie. Just call it what it is. They're lying. But no, we have this word. That was just disinformation. It's partially true. It, it's kind of opinion. It could be true. Shh. No, it's a, it's a lie. It's not a truth. It's a lie. But I live in a world where lies are not lies anymore. Right? And that's Kunzum Denpa. That's coming from my own ignorance. That's coming from the fact that I think things are out there by themselves on their own for no reason at all. And that I have no relationship to them other than my eyeballs are looking at them. Or that I'm, my ears are hearing them. And it's really in a lot of ways, it's a, it's a very powerful tool that those who have negative intentions can utilize very, very quickly because most people can't tell the difference, nor do they really care to tell the difference. Nor, or they just don't have the tools to tell the difference. 
Why? Because we are, our realities, which is very sad in some ways, our realities are limited to a two inch box that we hold in our hands called our phones. Right? It's even this here, like the reality of this, what the hell's going on? I'm looking at a camera and I'm looking at squares on the screen and this is reality. There are how many people here? 83, 93 people here. Are there really 93 people here with me? I hope so. This is Kunzon Demba. <laughs> am I really on your computer? Are you, am I, is the sounds, no. There are digital ones and zeros being transmitted across the world that look like me and sound like me. I'm a deep fake for you right now. You're not even seeing me. You're not even hearing me. I'm not even seeing you. I'm here by myself in my kitchen. I got some cats and I got some hummingbirds outside and I got some cold coffee. That's all I got. And ants. Thank you, Jillian. <laughs> right? I'm a deep fake for you. Yet you think I'm real. There's nothing less real about me than the fact that I'm sitting on your computer or phone right now. And yet you somehow think that the sounds that are coming out of your computer make sense. I hope they make sense. <laughs> I hope the words make sense. I hope they do. Somehow we went from 40 people to 93 people really quickly. That's great. More people wish it in emptiness. Okay. But listen, listen, you have to understand that the world that you live in is deceptive because you think it's out there by itself and it has nothing to do with you. That you close your eyes, you blink out of existence, and that world still goes on. Does not go on the way you think it goes on. Is there a world there after you blink out of existence? Yes, but not the way you think. And that's why you need to get to Dundam Dempa. You have to get to ultimate reality. Everyone turn on your microphones. Dundam Demba. Okay, we just heard 92, 93 people say Dundam Demba. Excellent. All right. And if you if you can hold this object correctly, which is ultimate reality, dun -dun, ultimate reality, highest reality, the highest reality that's not a reality in a positive sense, it's a reality in a negative sense, it's something that's not there. It's the lack, it's an emptiness. It's a lack of something that could never have not come from your seeds. I hope I said that right. Okay. You think something's there by itself, but it's not. It's there because you put it there vis-a-vis -vis how you treated people in the past. And if you can see the absence of that, then you can clean up all of your impurities. You can just throw them into the trash truck and clean them all up and you can get to nirvana or even higher than that. The whole point of what we're doing here is to be able to end our negative emotions, our negative experiences. And how do we do that? How do we do that? How do we end that? By teaching people that to get what you want, you have to give it to other people first. And if everybody operated that way, you wouldn't have bombs falling next door.
right? I saw a really, I'll just finish with this. I, I'm, I'm gonna see if I can find it. I sent it to a friend, I'll post it for you guys. I saw a really funny video of a world summit that was all the leaders in that summit were all women. <laughs> you may, it's, it's on Instagram right now. And they were going through things like the economy, the environment and war and all these things, right? And basically, they're not having any problems. It, it's it's kind of funny in the sense that like saying that if 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 women ran the entire world, we wouldn't have war. And they showed all the things that the women were doing that would have stopped wars in the way that they were communicating with each other and working out their differences and talking about things. And I, And it was really poignant to me, not as a criticism of, of men so much, but as a criticism of the way that we do things in the world. That if we learned, if we had all of our world leaders, whether they're men or women or non-binary, don't care about your gender. If everyone is in the room and everyone has this idea, if our world leaders had that idea in mind, that the decisions that they're making that they're evaluating them, is this something that I want for myself or not? And if I want that for myself, I need to give it to somebody else first. If all of our world leaders were at a world summit and had that perspective, what would the world be like? If people understood that the things that they were seeing were coming from them and our world leaders were doing that, what kind of world or planet will we have? And that's the point of this class. You know, that's the point of this class. What would it look like? What would your family look like if everyone believed that? Just in the family, <laughs> right? How would you all get along? How would you handle conflict? How would Tim handle the conflict with the guy in the cafe? Right? What about your workplace? What about your sangha, right? <laughs> your, your dharma sangha. The best place to find mental afflictions is the Dharma Sangha because, oh, we're not supposed to have them anymore. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know, watch drama in the Sangha, but watch what happens when you have a group of people who try to operate this way, how they resolve conflict, how they navigate everything. And that's what we're going to be doing in this class. We're going to be learning the depths of emptiness. So then we can create a world that is like that, where it wouldn't be satire or funny to see a video of, of, of world leaders all sitting around the table solving their problems by just being adults and talking to each other and understanding where the things come from. You know, then it wouldn't be funny, then it'd be a reality. Cool. Welcome to class one. Thank you all for joining. <laughs> Thank you. So we have a half hour break. We're going to start going into translating, continuing to translate the Lam Rim. It's getting juicy and it's getting really good. So if you'd like to stick around for that, please do. Otherwise, do watch those classes because these classes are going to teach you how to meditate properly. This whole class, this next 10 classes are all about what happens in meditation and what to do in meditation and how to recognize when you're doing it wrong and when you're doing it right. So then maybe you can see emptiness directly. <laughs> cool. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, translators. Thank you, tech teams. Thank you, everyone, for recording. And most importantly, just thank you for coming. Um, it's really an honor to, you know, that after, you know, all these years we have, almost a hundred people here who want to study this together. So um, lastly, please be befriend everyone. Find somebody in this group that you like and just talk to them. Just be like, hey, can we do the homework together? Can we, can I debate this with you? I don't understand this. Um, find friends, because those are the people that are gonna help you when you're having a bad day, when your afflictions become so strong that you forget where it's coming from 
And then you need a friend to be like, oh, I got you. I love you. It's coming from you. You know, after you feel a little bit better, then they kind of whisper in your ear and they're like, they're like stop being a jerk. <laughs> it's coming from you. And then, then you're like, oh, I know, but I feel terrible. And you can then they can be there while you're feeling terrible. Okay, cool. Take a break. We'll see you in 25 minutes if you're sticking around. And turn on your microphones and say goodbye to each other. Thank you. Gracias, Maestro Team. Thank you, Thank you. Teacher Team. Te esperamos en Colombia. Gracias, gracias. Gracias, Team. Thank you. Bye, everyone. See you in a few minutes.